Okay, so again, good afternoon. Um, for this particular topic, I will be discussing on Staphylococcus. So Staphylococcus is, of course, considered to be as a gram-positive toxin. So Staphylococcus um, is one of the very important organisms that we will be discussing here in bacteriology. So they are spherical, non-motile, grape-like, and they are arranged in grape-like cluster. In fact, um, if you will be asking me the difference between Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, so when you say Staphylococcus, they are arranged in a grape-like cluster, but when we say Streptococcus, they are arranged in a chain-like fashion. So they do not have any capsule. Um, they are non-spore former. They are aerobic facultative anaerobe. So when you say facultative anaerobe, they are aerobic by nature, but can still live even in the absence of oxygen. Um, they are strongly catalyst passive. So later on, I will be discussing what is a catalyst. But uh, just to give you a background, um, catalyst is actually an enzyme that can hydrolyze hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So later on, we will be discussing um, what's the importance of catalyst test. And just so to give you another background is that streptococcus is catalyst negative, while staphylococcus is catalyst positive. So all of them can actually ferment glucose, except for one species, and that is staphylococcus saprophyticus. So as again, uh, as you can see here, they are gram-positive coxi. So uh, I cannot really change my the color of the pen right now. It's too late for me to do that, but they're supposed to be. So when you say gram-positive coxi, it's supposed to be purple. And they are arranged in grape-like manner. So some of them appear singly some of them appears by pairs and they appear like bunches of grapes okay so the morphology appears to be creamy white or really light gold so the morphology that we are referring here is actually pertaining to the colonial characteristics so what do you mean by colonial characteristics um the colony appearance as they appear on the surface of the culture plate. So that's what we meant. That's what we meant by colonial characteristics. Or sometimes you will be, uh, you will be um, encountering the word cultural characteristics or colonial characteristics or the appearance of the colonies. So the colonies are creamy white or sometimes light gold. In fact, the term aureus refers to gold. Okay, battery looking, and some produces beta hemolysis. So later on, we will be describing and discussing the different kinds of hemolysis. But when we say beta hemolysis, we are referring to the complete hemolysis in blood agar plate. So there is a blood agar plate, and Staphylococcus aureus is capable of complete hemolysis in blood agar plate. So later on, I will be also introducing to you the three types of hemolysis. So as what I've mentioned, um, they are non-motile because they do not have flagella. They are non-spore former and they do not have any capsule. And I've already mentioned that they are either aerobic or facultative anaerobic except for Staphylococcus saccharolyticus because this particular species are considered to be is considered to be as obligate anaerobic, meaning to say this species cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. So again, um, this is the bunch of grapes appearance as described earlier. But and this is how they look like under ordinary light microscope. So as what I've mentioned, some of them appear singly. Some of them appears by pair. Some of them appear like bunch of grapes. And this is the appearance of Staphylococcus aureus as described under the electron microscope. OK. 
agar-tree. So, this is an example of colonies of blood agar-tree, okay? So, Staphylococcus is actually part of Micrococcus. So, I mean, Micrococcia. Micrococcia, that's the family. And one of the genus or one of the genera in Micrococcia family is Micrococcus luteus. So, it's an example, again, of a gram-positive cocci that is also catalase-positive. Okay. So that is catalyst positive and and um, this is also a coagulase negative organism. So again, um, coagulase, uh, we will be discussing it later on. It's an enzyme that can coagulate plasma. So, being a coagulase positive is actually exclusive for Staphylococcus aureus. So, since this is a Micrococcus luteus, um, they are not actually um, coagulase positive. Okay, so it has a distinct yellow pigmented colony. Okay, and they are generally considered as non pathogenic. So, later on, we will be revealing that there are three medically important species of Staphylococcus. I'm just introducing to you um, the species that are closely related to Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so speaking of clinically significant species, so as what I've told you a while ago, there are three clinical, clinically important species. So we have Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, do you know that um, Staphylococcus aureus reside, okay, in your anterior nares, nares, okay? Meaning to say, yung mga mahilig mga ulang, hot after nila mga ulang, at maraming staphylococcus or yung kamay, okay? So, but minsan, ganun, ganun no, nung mga, yung mga ulang, hot, tapos gaganon, di nila alam, wow, oh, dami pa na staphylococcus or yung. So, 20 to 30% of humans carries staphylococcus or yung at the anterior nares. So, Staphylococcus aureus is the primary pathogen of the genus, okay? And they are capable of producing superficial infections such as in the skin or even systemic infections such as bacterial sepsis. So it's actually uh, dangerous because when we say sepsis, it means that the bacteria are found in the blood and they are actively dividing. So they are Three clinically important species, as what I told you, as aureus, as epidermidis, and as saprophyticus. So, Staphylococcus aureus mode of transmission would most likely be traumatic introduction because they are mostly found in skin. So, which means that when you um, prick your patient, it's very important that you apply antiseptic because the needle stick the needle stick uh, would introduce organisms if the surface or if the area that you will be pricking the, 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 the skin was not actually, uh, you, if you did not apply antiseptics on that particular area. So whenever there would be destruction of skin layers, such as in cases of burns, road rash, okay, or as a result of a medical procedure, so usually we call it iatrogenic. Okay. So these particular practices okay, can actually introduce staphylococcus aureus inside our body. Okay. So therefore, there are people who are more predisposed to have staphylococcus aureus as compared to the rest. So those that have chronic infections, meaning to say staphylococcus aureus could pose as a secondary bacterial infection on top of the primary infection. So, for example, if the patient has COVID-19, okay, so it could, Staphylococcus aureus can, could, could, could pose as a secondary bacterial infection. Or if the person has indwelling devices, such as catheter, or skin injuries, because skin is a protective barrier that protects us from infections and even immune response defects. So it meaning to say if you are immuno, 
compromise. Okay, so you will be at risk of getting. Um, you are you are more predisposed to get Staphylococcus aureus infection. So, um, there are various variants of Staphylococcus. So, again, to describe Staphylococcus aureus, they are capable of producing golden yellow pigment, particularly in MSA or manitol salt agar. Again, the word aurea refers to gold. That's why if you will be looking at gold at the periodic table of elements, its symbol is AU. Okay? So there are variants of Staphylococcus aureus, such as Citrus, which can produce a lemon yellow pigment, or Albus, which can produce a porcelain white pigment. So these are just variants. So if you're going to if you're going to um, look at the colonies of Staphylococcus aureus, they would have the so-called oil paint appearance. Okay, and again, uh, in manitol salt agar, um, they would produce the golden yellow pigment. In potassium tellurite medium, um, it will produce jet black colonies. Okay. And in bad blood agar plate, as what I've mentioned to you, um, they are considered to be as beta hemolytic. Okay, so coagulase. I, I did mention to you coagulase a while ago. So do you know that coagulase is one of the one of the viral uh, one of the enzymes, virulence factors being produced by Staphylococcus aureus in particular. So Staphylococcus aureus um, can produce coagulase enzyme, which could clot plasma. Okay, and only Staphylococcus aureus among the human pathogens could be positive with coagulase test. So that is the reason why um, coagulase test is considered to be as the best single criterion to determine the pathogenicity of Staphylococcus. Because only Staphylococcus aureus, a human pathogen, uh, shall be positive with the coagulase test. So, Staphylococcus delphini, Intermedius, Hyacus, Scleferi are animal pathogens. Although they are also coagulase positive, but they are considered to be as animal pathogens. And then, we also have the so-called coagulase negative staphylococci. So, we call them the cons. Do you know that even if they are coagulase negative, um, they can also be pathogenic at some extent? So, for example, Staphylococcus epidermidis may cause hospital acquired infection. So, later on, I will be explaining to you that they have the so called slime factor. And then, Staphylococcus saprophyticus may cause urinary tract infections in young, sexually active female. And that is the reason why they are important pathogens, particularly if isolated from urine samples. Okay, so that is for Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Okay, so let's talk about the virulence factors. Okay, so when we say virulence factors, these are the factors present in the organisms um, that may, that will make them more harmful than ordinary bacteria. So, um, these particular virulence factors could be in the forms of toxins, it could be in the forms of enzymes and others. Okay, so one of them is enterotoxin. Okay, so enterotoxin um, obviously, when you say entero, we are referring to the target site or the target organ, which are the epithelial cells of the intestine. And enterotoxins are 
heat stable exotoxins so the diba, exotoxins are found in gram positive bacteria and may, they may cause diarrhea and vomiting so enterotoxin is actually implicated in staphylococcal food poisoning So, enterotoxins are implicated in staphylococcal food poisoning. And then, we also have toxins A to E and G to I. So, A, B, C, D, E, and then G, H, I. So, a total of eight. So, these toxins are actually resistant to gastric acid and associated also with the staphylococcal food poisoning. And... Incidentally, toxins B, C, G, and I are associated with toxic shock. So, uh, people with toxic shock would have a rapid drop in blood pressure. And then, we also have the toxic shock syndrome toxin 1. Okay. So, this one is toxin F. Okay, so that's designated as toxin F. So if you notice, bakit walang F dito? Because this particular toxin F is designated as the TSST1 or the toxin F. So it is produced by phage group 1. Meaning to say Staphylococcus aureus would have this. Since we're talking about bacteriophage, Staphylococcus aureus would have this by means of transduction. Remember our discussion? Transduction. So obviously, toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 can cause toxic shock syndrome. So later on, we will be discussing paano ba nagkakaroon ng toxic shock syndrome. And do you know that females are more predisposed to have toxic shock syndrome as compared to males? Okay? So toxic shock syndrome toxins 1 Okay, um, and the one that is listed here, such as the toxin, uh, toxin B, C, G, are considered to be as super antigens. So when we say super antigens, um, we define them as a class of antigens that are considered to be as a microbial peptides. So these are microbial peptides that can activate the immune system and can contribute to autoimmune disorder. Okay? So they can contribute to autoimmune disorder. Okay? So that's why um, these particular antigens are actually, are actually dangerous. Okay? If you have any question, you can always interrupt me and I will be entertaining your questions. Okay, so moving on with the virulence factor, Staphylococcus aureus would also have the so-called exfoliative toxin. Okay, so when you say exfoliative toxin, so this toxin is known as the epidermolytic toxin. So what will usually happen here is that your skin will slough off Okay, and will scald. So, this particular disease is known as Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome, the quadruple S, otherwise known as the Ritter's disease. And it may be related also with bullus impetigo. So, later on, so we'll have a photograph of how does it look like. Okay. And then, aside from exfoliative toxins, Staphylococcus aureus is really indeed very dangerous because of the leucosidine. Or leucosidine is sometimes known as the PVL. Okay, the Panton Valentine leucosidine. Why is it dangerous? Because leucosidine can kill our polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Meaning to say, PVL can kill our segmenters. It can kill our neutrophils. Is it dangerous? Yes, because neutrophils, segmenters, are part of our defense. 
So if the organisms will kill the basic defense of our body, therefore, phagocytosis will not happen. Because the action of neutrophils and segmenters would be to phagocytize microorganisms such as Staphylococcus aureus. But because of the PDL, that mechanism is prevented. And then, of course, um, uh, they, are, they are also capable of producing various cytolytic toxins, and one of them is the hemolysins. When you say hemolysins, hemolysins are, are toxins that can lyse RBC. And there are three main types. Actually, there are four of hemolysins, and they are designated as alpha, beta, and delta. The fourth one is gamma, but it says here it's generally not important. So the alpha hemolysin destroys platelets and tissues. Therefore, it will result to the so-called alpha hemolysis and when you say alpha hemolysis, it means it is incomplete hemolysis. The beta hemolysin, okay, so this is the second toxin, shows enhanced activity by acting on the sphingomyelin of the RBC membrane. Sphingomyelin is very important for RBC because it keeps the membrane of the RBC intact. So once the sphingomyelin is destroyed, there would be lysis of RBC. So beta hemolysin therefore results to complete hemolysis. So beta hemolysin results to complete hemolysis. Now another variant of such is the so-called hot cold lysins because it works best at 37 degrees and very well when stored at 4 degrees centigrade. Changes in, in temperature will allow them to work best. Hence, the variant is the hot cold lysine. And the delta hemolysine causes injury to cells and leukocytes, but it is less lethal. So, to determine also the virulence of Staphylococcus aureus, uh, we also have enzymes. Okay? So, so these enzymes are the coagulase enzymes. It says here it is diagnostic, but the importance in virulence is not completely understood. Why diagnostic? Because we have the coagulase test to determine whether the organism is staphylococcus or use or not. And there are two types of coagulase tests. It can be done using the tube method and the other one is the slide method. I will be discussing it later on. So it's mostly diagnostic. Okay? And then the other one is hyaluronidase. Okay? Hyaluronidase is, no, is capable of hydrolyzing hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid is an important component of ground substance which is part of the matrix of the connective tissue. So if this particular ground substance is destroyed, it will help spread the infection. Therefore, hyaluronidase is sometimes called as the spreading factor. So hyaluronidase is sometimes called as the spreading factor because it can destroy the hyaluronic acid present in the ground substance which serves as the matrix of connective tissue. Lipase is another enzyme and it can cause breakdown of fats and oil created by the sebaceous gland on the skin surface. That's why the, much, the more oily your skin is, the more prone the more prone you are to get 
um, pimples caused by Staphylococcus aureus because you're feeding more oil to the bacteria. Hence, oiliness is next to ugliness. Nako, biglang yung mga naka-turn on ng camera, nakita ko, nagpunas-punas na. <laughs> Ayan. So, that's true. And that's why it's very important to wash your to wash your face every now and then because you do not want to clog your pores with dirt and oil will not be able to come out. So oil will be entrapped. Tapos, it will be seen as opportunity for organisms to thrive on that particular area because of the presence of oil or lipids. And they have lipase to hydrolyze it. Protein A is another important virulence factor of Staphylococcus aureus. Um, protein A can bind at the FC portion of the antibodies to prevent phagocytosis. So if this is this is the immunoglobulin, this is the FAB, and then this is the FC, fragment crystalline. So what will happen is that protein A will bind at the FC, preventing phagocytosis to happen. And also, protein A will mask of its immunogenic proteins, which host proteins to look like self. So it will fool our immune system and thereby assist in blocking phagocytosis. Okay, so in summary, so these are just some of the virulence factors of Staphylococcus aureus that we had just discussed. Okay, so a while ago, I was talking about hemolysine. And I was telling you that there are actually three types of hemolysis. Okay, so where can we observe hemolysis? Hemolysis can be observed in blood agar plate. Okay, so if you're not yet familiar with blood agar plate, sorry, blood agar plate is actually made up of blood agar base plus 5 to 10% sheep's blood. Okay. And blood agar plate is considered to be as the culture medium that is enriched and will support fastidious organisms such as Staphylococcus aureus. So when we say fastidious organisms, it means that they would require additional nutrients. Okay. So again, sheep's blood is the ideal blood to use. So if sheep's blood is not available, so sometimes we are using horse RBC. If horse RBC is not available, most of the time, hospitals are using human blood, expired human blood from the blood bank. But, you know, that's not really very ideal because what if the, those, the humans that serves as the donor had actually taken antibiotics? So the antibiotics will be inhibitory for the growth of Staphylococcus and the organisms will not be able to grow. Okay, so that's why ideally it has to be 5 to 10% sheep's blood. And if you're going to heat the blood, it will turn brown. Hence, the term now is chocolate agar plate. So there's no Hershey's or Cadbury's in chocolate agar plate. So the only difference is that blood agar plate is, heat, is unheated Chocolate agar plate is unheated. Okay, so let's now talk about the types of hemolysis. Okay, so alpha, beta, and gamma. So here it is incomplete. I have explained this to you a while ago. And we have here incomplete. And gamma means there's no hemolysis. Okay. So this is an example of alpha hemolysis. Okay, so this, when we say alpha hemolysis, sorry, let's go back again. Alpha hemolysis is incomplete hemolysis. How would you know if it's alpha? By looking at the surface of the blood agar plate, you would notice that it is greenish brown. So if the surface of the blood agar plate appears greenish brown, then that's alpha hemolysis. This one is um, beta hemolysis. How do we know if it's beta? Because it's colorless. Sir, it's yellow. No, 
ano yan, colorless yan. Kaya lang siya naging mukhang yellow, it's because, um, perhaps because of the reflection of the light. Okay, but it's supposed to be colorless. So, beta hemolysis means colorless. So, you have to look at the surface of the blood agar pea. And then, this one is a gamma hemolysis. Uh, pag sinabi natin gamma hemolysis, it means that no hemolysis has taken place. So, if you'll be looking at the surface of the blood agar plate, it remains intact. Red cells remain intact. So, this is a gamma hemolysis. Again, alpha hemolysis is incomplete. You'll see greenish brown. Beta hemolysis means there's a complete hemolysis. And then gamma hemolysis means that there's no hemolysis. So, for beta hemolysis, you'll be able to see colorless colonies at the surface, on the surface of the blood agar plate. Okay, so greenish brown, colorless, and then no hemolysis or gamma. Okay? So let's talk about um, the epidemiology of Staphylococcus aureus. So as what I told you, the primary reservoir would be our mares, yung ilong natin. And other reservoirs would include axillae, vagina, pharynx, and other skin surfaces. When I was still teaching the, well, I was, when I was still teaching in the lab during the face-to-face -face classes, usually one of our experiments would be, um, we have this sterile cotton swab, and then the contest is called, uh, so meron na, meron na kami ginagawang squid game dati, but might be pa using squid game. So, the, what we're using is, uh, the cot is called uh, padamihan ng libag. So, each one of the classmates, each one of their classmates would receive a sterile cotton swab, and then they will swab staphylococcus, uh, they will swab the sterile cotton swab at different parts of her body. So, sometimes sa axillae, sa ano, sa skin, sa paa, and then, if this is the blood agar plate, we divide it like a pizza, and then they swab it. In a swab na ganon. And then padamihan. So 24 hours after, you will see which among of your classmates have the most number of staphylococcus. Have the most number of, of staphylococcus. Actually, hindi pala sa blood agar plate. Uh, yeah, in MSA, manitol salt agar. And you would notice that it is staphylococcus or use because of the golden yellow colonies. And so... Yeah, that's a very exciting experiment, and unfortunately, we'll not be able to do that. But at least, uh, I'm describing to you the experience. Okay? And hospital outbreaks uh, would also have staphylococcus aureus, so sometimes uh, we call it nosocomial infection. So when we say nosocomial infection, we're referring to hospital-acquired infection. So... There could be outbreaks in nurseries, in burn units, or even among surgical patients. So, as what I've told you before, uh, they are found at the surface of the skin, meaning they can actually cause skin and wound infection. So, they are past formers. Okay? So, they are pyogenic. So when you say pyogenic, they are past formers. And this could be in the form of boil. So boil, parankel or boil. Um, in Tagalog, we call it pigsa. And so hindi pala totoo na magkakapigsa kayo kapag itupuan niyo yung unan. Okay, so pigsa is caused by staphylococcus aureus. It is a painful inflammation of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. It's much deeper than your pinpoint because it's found located on subcutaneous tissue. Okay? So, yung iba pinipisil yung pigsa hanggang lumabas yung mata, but it's gonna be so painful because it's much deeper. And if there are multiple lesions and may even progress into a deeper tissues, we call it carbuncles. And carbuncles since it is much deeper, sometimes may require um, drainage or even surgical intervention. Okay? So, 
folliculitis is the infection of the hair follicle. This one is very common. And another one is the bullus impetigo. impetigo. Um, it is the large pustules surrounded by a small zone of erythema. They are highly contagious because it can spread by direct contact when you touch someone else's skin with bullus impetigo or by fomites, okay, such as pen. So this could be considered as a fomite. Mask. Gloves. So these are fomites, doorknobs. So sometimes um, uh, these occur due to black follicles, sebaceous gland and sweat glands. So yun nga yung sinasabi ko, if you have, if you have a black follicle, so the chances of you getting skin infection would be very high. So this is an example of folliculitis. So as you can see, yeah, so it's, there's a past. So the infected hair follicle is here. So past is, form, is formed. Paranquil, exact. Okay. In Tagalog, it says, hinugna. Okay. So because you can actually see the past. Okay. So this is a single draining and large paranquil. Carbuncle is much deeper, yeah, much deeper. And there are sometimes even multiple lesions. And then this is an example of a bullus impetigo. There's a pustule and there's a liquid. I just heard something over there, but I will just ignore it. <laughs> All right, so um, it is... Uh, so this con postules meaning to say it's actually a skin lesion that has pus and liquid and sometimes if you're going the liquid draining from this particular postules would be highly infectious or highly contagious um necroti necrotizing fasciitis so it's actually the inflammation of the fascia so in between the skin and muscles there's a fascia Okay, so if that is infected, so we call it fasciitis. Though, necrotizing fasciitis is more common for streptococcus, more significant. Um, in fact, that's the reason why they call streptococcus as the flesh-eating bacteria, because of the necrotizing fasciitis. And so multiple boils lesions. And then a while ago, we were talking about the SSSS, the Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome, otherwise known as the Ritter's disease. So there is a extensive exfoliative dermatitis, most likely to occur among renal failure patients and immunocompromised patients. Severity would range from mild to severe, Okay, so when you say mild, um, there would just be localized lesion and severe would generally have more area coverage when it comes to lesions. So there is a profuse painful feeling of the epidermal layer. A single touch of that skin would cause um, extreme pain for the patients. Okay, so it could last about two to four days, but there is actually a more spontaneous recovery in children, but for adults, it may actually lead to uh, mortality, probably because of the possible co-occurrences with renal failure. And so, as you can see, it is an example of a severe Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome. Okay, so you see that there's an extensive profuse peeling of the skin. And then we also have uh, the toxic epidermal necrolysis. So it can be caused by multiple factors such as it could be drug-induced, infections, or even as a result of side effects of vaccines, though we do not officially know about it. So it is similar to 
Staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome. So the difference is that these um, patients would respond well with steroids, unlike with SSSS, that patients do not, re do not usually respond well with steroids. Um, PEN has a very high mortality rate. And then the toxic shock syndrome, remember the toxin F, toxin F or the TSSE1. So this one may be related to the toxic shock syndrome, which is associated with the usage of super absorbent tampons. If you guys are not familiar with tampons and some of the ladies here may not be familiar with tampons, we are usually using tampons, no, not me, you are usually using tampons um, to control uh, menstruation. So usually uh, to regulate, so that not really regulate, but you know, um, these are being used by ballerinas or by swimmers. Okay, so that uh, uh, it's different from sanitary napkins. Uh, okay, but because there's something that will be inserted okay, uh, during uh, during menstruation. So before, siguro, the tampons are not disposable. I, I'm not sure, but if tampons are not sanitary, not hygienic, there's a chance that ladies will get infected with staphylococcus aureus. So there will be high fever, then rashes will start from trunk, and then it will spread to extremities. And then watery diarrhea, then there would be vomiting, which can result to dehydration. And the reason why we call it shock, because of the extreme decrease in blood pressure, and it may lead to hypotension. Okay, so that's the reason why we call it shock. And one of the significant consequences of toxic shock syndrome is the so-called DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So it's like the presence of clots in vivo, which is dangerous, especially if clots are present in major blood vessels. Okay, so usually you will learn more about it in hematu. So there is a test called D-dimer. So D-dimer test uh, would determine the extent of the DIC. And this is also associated with increase in BUN and creatinine. So these are these uh, these are examples of renal function tests. The presence of BUN and creatinine. Fatal in 2 to 5% of cases due to multi organ system failure, particularly if the kidneys are have failed already. So this became fatal. Okay, so toxic shock syndrome uh, may also be associated with use, using, um, of course, diaphragm and mostly um, tampons. And then food poisoning. Um, Toxins, food poisoning is caused by toxin, not by bacterial growth causing the disease. Okay, so usually it is caused by enterotoxin A and B, A to D, A, B, C, D, but A and D are the most common cause of food poisoning. So it is enterotoxin. So usually they really want food that is rich in nutrients, such as mayonnaise. Okay, so if there has been inadequate refrigeration of, of rich food such as potato salad or mayonnaise, and so there's a chance that, um, you know, when you prepare your salad unhygienically, so and then there's an inadequate refrigeration, microorganisms will grow such as Staphylococcus aureus, and as they grow, they would also produce toxins. The thing is, even if you will be reheating the food, though we do not reheat salad, the thing is, even if you will be reheating the food, um, 
the what will happen is that the organisms Staphylococcus aureus will die, but the enterotoxins are heat stable, and since they are heat stable, they would remain intact and may can cause and, and may cause food poisoning. So symptoms usually appear about two to eight hours after ingesting food. So usually it will resolve within one to two days and symptoms would include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and trembling. This is very common, especially during Christmas party. Diba? So during Christmas party, they will prepare spaghetti early in the morning using contaminated hands. And then pagdating sa afternoon, the organisms have already multiplied a lot and even if you will reheating the food, when you reheat the food, okay, bacteria will die, that's for sure. But the toxin remains present. Okay, so that's the implication of the food poison. So these are the foods that mostly involve in food staphylococcal food poisoning. So let's see if you're fond of any of these. Salad, bakery products such as fresh cream cakes, milk and dairy products, sandwiches, meat and meat products such as sliced and processed meat, meat pies, cured ham, cured, cured hams, poultry and egg products, and so So again, if there are heat, enterotoxins are heat stable, and it is caused by an unhygienic preparation of food. So other infections, um, Staphylococcus may cause secondary pneumonia after influenza A, which is H1N1. But H1N1 may cause pandemic. COVID-19 may cause, it is, we are in pandemic because of COVID-19. So Staphylococcus aureus may serve as a secondary bacterial infection. Um, there could be bacteremia and endocarditis. So when you say bacteremia and endocarditis, um, it is due to, uh, you know, you IV drug addicts presenting with fever. So yung mga drug addicts, so um, pwede silang mag ano. Siyempre pag drug, pag drug addict, hindi naman siya, ah, pre, ito na yung drugs. So, teka muna pre, mag-apply muna ako ng 70% alcohol, you know, antiseptics, degerming. <laughs> hindi naman ganun. <laughs> diba, hindi naman sila ganun. So usually, pinapasa muna nila yung mga ano, yung mga needles unhygienically. So, don't do that. Okay, and then osteomyelitis is another example of secondary to bacteremia. So again, when you say bacteremia, bacteria are present in blood. What's the difference between bacteremia and sepsis? When you say bacteremia, bacteria are just present in blood. But when you say sepsis, bacteria are present in blood and they are actively dividing. Okay? So again, in osteomyelitis, um, bacteria are present in blood and they will invade the bone. So there would be fever, chills, swelling, and pain around the infected area. Arthritis if bacteria is found in the joint. So we specifically call it as septic arthritis. So we call it as the septic arthritis. Okay, so let's talk about Staphylococcus epidermidis. So we were just talking about Staphylococcus aureus a while ago. Now it's about time that we discuss about Staphylococcus epidermidis. So Staphylococcus epidermidis is predominantly nosocomial infection. Again, when we say nosocomial infection, we are referring to bacterial, a uh, hospital acquired infection. So they are usually found in our skin. That's why it's called epidermitis. Okay. So skin flora gets introduced in catheters, heart valves, and even CSF shunts. So eventually, um, they will produce a slime layer or biofilm. So it helps uh, again, we have discussed already biofilms and you know why they are formed. And it will help adherence to prosthetic and avoidance of phagocytosis. 
Staphylococcus epidermidis may also cause UTI. So remember the term cons, Staphylococcus epidermidis is part of it. So Staphylococcus epidermidis is a resident flora for skin. So they are coagulase negative but novoviocin sensitive. So this refers to the antibiotic use novel biosin. So they have a slime factor. Slime factor would allow them to adhere to artificial devices such as catheter shunts. Okay, so they can be implicated in various diseases such as the abscess, mild UTI, endocarditis, bacteremia, and meningitis. So again, this is an example of how staphylococcus epidermidis can infect the catheter. So, uh, it is a normal flora. So, we need to say they are normally found in our skin. So, we have staphylococcus epidermidis. But because catheter here is an artificial device, and because they are capable of forming biofilm, so there would be now slime production. So the slime production will allow Staphylococcus epidermidis to be firmly attached to the catheter. Once it is produced, once the slime is produced, it is impossible to get rid of them. So there's a need for you to change catheter. So that's why it's not really, it's not really advisable to have a prolonged use of catheter. So you need to change catheter on a regular basis. So it's really painful on the part of the patients to be in catheter. So Staphylococcus saprophyticus is another one that is implicated in UTI among young sexually active women. So um, it is due to the fact that there is an increased adherence to epithelial cells lining in the urogenital tract. Okay, so it is rarely present in other skin or mucous membrane. So usually it's a urogenital tract lamp. So that's why if found in urine, it is something that is significant. So urine culture is significant even if present in low amounts. So, kahit na konti lang yung urine culture with Staphylococcus saprophyticus, then it is considered to be as significant. Okay, so unlike Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphylococcus saprophyticus is novoviocin resistant. Okay, but both of them, Staphylococcus um, epidermidis and Staphylococcus saprophyticus, both of them are coagulase negative. So they are part of the so-called POTS, coagulase negative staphylococcus. But they are novoviocin resistant. So what does it mean? It means that you're going to have a culture of staphylococcus epidermidis, and then you add novoviocin of a virus in disc, there is no zone of inhibition because Staphylococcus saprophyticus is novo virusin resistant. So there won't be any zone of inhibition. Other cons would include Staphylococcus hemolyticus the second most common cons and can be found in wounds, UTI, bacteria, and endocarditis. Really, recently, we have noted that they are resistant to vancomycin, which is dangerous because vancomycin is one of the strongest drugs for staphylococcus. So if you get resistant to vancomycin, that's dangerous. Okay, other opportunistic pathogens would include Staphylococcus lugdunensis and Staphylococcus clayferi. Okay, aren't you loving the names of this bacteria? No? 
Ludonensis, and Sclaferi. Okay, so let's talk about the laboratory diagnosis of Staphylococcus. So basically, we have microscopic examination. So here, you'll be able to see numerous gram-positive cocci. And since they are past formers, you'll be able to see um, neutrophils, PMN, segmenters. So, and if you are handling clinical specimen, uh, you would be able to see purely, isolate them from purulent exudates. So, pag sinabi natin exudates, we are referring to fluid resulting from inflammatory processes. Joint fluids, if you are suspecting septic arthritis, and even aspirated secretions. Aspirate is the best because we can actually maintain its sterility if done in, of course, a sterile condition. So there should be a septic technique. So, sorry, yeah. this is how they look like. Um, they are purple since they are gram positive. So this is how they look like under the microscope. And this is how they look like under the electron microscope. This one is stained with gram stain. Okay. So this is another example of blood agar plate. So here we ha can see cons growing on top on the surface of the sheep's blood agar. And since the red cell remains intact, so we consider them as gamma hemolytic. But you can see that the colonies appear like white and creamy. If it is battery looking, most likely we are looking at Staphylococcus aureus. But since we are looking here at the white creamy colonies, these are not Staphylococcus aureus. Okay. So here is another example of culture media. So it's Columbia CNA agar. Okay. They can grow easily on blood agar plate and thioglycolate. If heavily contaminated, you can use selective medium. So these are examples of selective media. What do you mean by selective media? So these are discussed, this should be discussed in the laboratory. So when you say selective media, selective media means that you are adding inhibitory substances. You're adding inhibitory substances to the culture medium so that only the desired organisms will grow and undesired organisms will not be able to grow. Okay, so in cases of Columbia cholestinale dixic acid agar, so you are adding cholestine and alidixic acid. This will inhibit gram negative bacteria. Okay. Or, for example, in cases of mannitol salt agar, you add a very high concentration of salt. And since you have added a very high concentration of salt, ibig sabihin, non-halophilic organisms, non-halophilic organisms will not be able to grow. So what do you mean by halophiles? Halophiles are salt-loving bacteria. Salt-loving bacteria. So what, that's what we meant by halophiles. By adding a very high salt concentrations, non-halophilic organisms okay, will not be able to grow. Staphylococcus aureus, therefore, is an example of halophilic organisms. Because even if you have added 10% sodium chloride, we are still able to grow in manitol salt agar. And another characteristic of 
of Staphylococcus aureus that they can ferment the sugar mannitol. Hence, MSA, mannitol salt agar. So, positive result for Staphylococcus aureus is the presence of of golden yellow colonies and we have we have um, phenol red as our pH indicator. So it means that um, the phenol red as a pH indicator. So what will happen here is that if for if there is a fermentation of mannitol, MSA will become acidic. If MSA becomes acidic, okay, if MSA becomes acidic, phenol red will turn to yellow. So that's the principle. If no fermentation of mannitol Therefore, it will become non-acidic. So, phenol red remains red or sometimes pink. Do you understand the principle of, my, of using pH indicator? So, the principle is that Staphylococcus aureus can ferment mannitol. And since they can ferment mannitol, okay, so since they can ferment mannitol, um, it, whenever fermentation has taken place, it will turn the medium acidic. If the medium tur turns acidic, phenol red will turn yellow. But if no fermentation of mannitol has taken place, therefore, it remains then acidic and phenol red remains red or pink in color. Okay, so again, this is the original appearance of mannitol salt agar if fermentation has taken place. We now have a golden yellow colonies. Okay, if it remains red or pink, it means that no mannitol fermentation. Another thing is that these organisms, both of these organisms are halophilic. Meaning to say they can tolerate 10% 10 10 sodium chloride. Because mannitol salt agar has 10% sodium chloride. So another very nice colonies of Staphylococcus aureus in mannitol salt agar. Okay, so let's talk about catalyst. So a while ago, we were talking about um, the catalyst test. Okay, so catalyst um, is the enzyme that can hydrolyze um, hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So here, we drop hydrogen peroxide onto the smear. Uh, ito yung in Tagalog or in Espanol, we call it agua oxygenada. Um, it's an excellent antiseptic. Okay. So bubbling is the positive result. Actually, a more scientific term to describe a positive result is called rapid effervescence of gas. Pero sige, bubbles na lang, mas madaling spell. Okay, so rapid effervescence of gas. So no bubbling means that it's negative. So usually, staphylococcus would be positive with catalyst test, and streptococcus would be negative, and other streptococcus, other lactic acid, means that there's no oxygen generated. Okay. So, rapid effervescence of gas is an example of a positive result. So, this is how it looks like. Okay, so, so the principle is that 
Staphylococcus contains the enzyme catalyst which converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. The test is performed by emulsifying a colony of Staphylococcus in hydrogen peroxide. So, this is, so you add first hydrogen peroxide and then you add now the bacteria. So, if there's rapid effervescence of gas, para nagkaroon ng bubbles, then that is positive result. If there's no rapid effervescence of gas, this is a negative result. Take note that you should not get you should not get colonies. from blood agar plate. So you should not get colonies from blood agar plate because blood has a natural catalyst. And if you will be getting colonies from blood agar plate, this will result to false positive results. And this explains the reason why Whenever your clothes okay, are, is actually stained with blood or pag minsan natagusan yung babae na stained yung skirt niya, the best way to remove blood stain is by using hydrogen peroxide. Kapag water yung ginamit ninyo, lalong kakalat yung blood. But if you're using hydrogen peroxide in a lab gown that has been stained with blood or clothes that has been smeared with blood, it will be easier to remove it because blood has a naturally occurring catalase enzyme. And since blood has a naturally occurring catalase enzyme, then we shouldn't be using colonies from blood agar plate for a catalase test. And then we also have the coagulase test. So coagulase is an enzyme um, that can clot um, plasma and you know already the difference between plasma and serum. So plasma has fibrinogen while serum do not have fibrinogen. Okay, so there are actually um, several types of coagulates. So we have the cell bound coagulates. Okay, and this is the clumping factor. Okay, um, we use uh, cell bound coagulase because um, the principle is that it can clot human, rabbit, or even pig plasma. So, for the slide method, we are using mixed suspension of organisms with a small amount of rabbit plasma. So, check for clumping. If clumping occurs, then it is considered to be as a positive result. So if clumping is negative, if clumping is negative, a, choose, a tube test should be performed. So the reason is that 5% of organisms do not produce cell-bound coagulates. So remember, the slide method is or will determine cell-bound coagulates, whereas the tube method will determine the free coagulates. So if clamping is negative, a tube test should be performed because the second type of coagulates is the extracellular free coagulates. So we have first the cell-bound coagulates and then the second type of coagulase is the extracellular free coagulase. Okay? So it is an extracellular enzyme secreted that clots the plasma. So just like the cell-bound coagulase, it can also clot the plasma. Okay? To determine if extracellular free coagulase is present, then we use tube method. Tube method is slightly more complicated than the slide method. So if you remember, in the, in the slide method, all you have to do is to add organisms onto the slide with plasma. But for the tube method, you have to add about 0.5 ml of plasma. 
and then you add look full of organisms and check for coagulation for four hours and after 24 hours you have to look again okay the reason why we have to check not beyond 24 hours because we do not because we prevent autolysis and this will result to false negative result you know why because after 24 hours okay so let's say for example this is the tube so between 4 to 24 hours coagulase is produced so if coagulase is produced there would be what there would be gel formation but after 24 hours the organisms will now produce staphylokinase Staphylokinase will dissolve what? Therefore, if you will be checking the result after 24 hours, this will result to false negative result. Okay, so this explains the reason why uh, when doing, this explains the reason why when doing um, coagulase test, when doing coagulase test, we do not read beyond 24 hours. So usually we have to read between 4 to 24 hours. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So it says here that coagulase test is the hallmark test for Staphylococcus aureus. In fact, I, I told you a while ago in the introduction, told you a while ago in the introduction that we consider coagulase test as the single best criterion to determine pathogenicity with Staphylococcus aureus because it is the only, Staphylococcus aureus is the only human pathogens that will yield positive results in coagulase test. So I hope that you will not be forgetting that. Okay? It is the only, Staphylococcus aureus is the only organism, human pathogens, that will yield positive results for coagulase test. Okay? Other Staphylococcus can produce positive coagulation, but they are not human pathogens. Usually, they do not exhibit the same colonial morphology. Again, so best single criterion for pathogenicity. Positive result is coagulation of plasma, and we're using saturated plasma. The tube method demonstrates free coagulase. The slide method demonstrates bound coagulase. Only SRUs, human pathogens, will be positive. So this is an example of a positive result. So as you can see, um, there is a clot formation. There's a gel formation of plasma. And here is the liquid. But liquid remains liquid. And yeah, negative result. So another example. So you can see turbid. Okay. So... Again, as you can see, these are the cups. So, meron tayong cones, meron tayong cups. The coagulase positive staphylococci and only staphylococcus aureus is the human pathogens. The rest are animal pathogens, such as uh, the subspecies anaerobius. Although we can also find staphylococcus aureus in animals. Staphylococcus haicus, intermediate clay fairy, 
subspecies coagulants and velvetine. And these are the cons, cups and cons. So we have several group, the epidermidis group, medyo madami dami, but the one that is very significant is yung epidermidis and saprophyticus group. So under the epidermidis group, marami rin yan. So you have hemolyticus, hominis, capitis, capre, articularis, saprolyticus, warneri, and pasteri. And then under the saprophyticus group, we have the saprophyticus, coni, coni, cylosus, arlete, ecorum, gallinarum, clusi, and lentus. If you notice, the coni has several subspecies, such as the subspecies coni and subspecies uralyticum. And then the staphylococcus simulans group. So we have the simulans and carnosus, and the intermediate group would have the scleferi, subspecies scleferi. In the sayuri group, we have Staphylococcus sayuri, lentus, and butulinus. For halicus, we have Staphylococcus chromogens. And lastly, we have the unspecified species, which includes Staphylococcus casiolyticus, Staphylococcus felis, Staphylococcus halicus, Staphylococcus bugdunensis, Staphylococcus nusi, and Staphylococcus pc fermentans. Break it down. May nagrap pala. Rap pala yun, di ako na-inform. Okay, so yun pala yung mga different species of cons or the coagulation negative staphylococcus. So, to know more about it, uh, please do not forget to read your book. Okay, so I actually screenshot this from May on. Okay, so how do we differentially differentiate micrococcus from the others? And so one of the tests that we can use is the bacitracine disk test, okay? So in bacitracine disk test, uh, we're using um, bacitracine disk, okay, taxo A. So if there is zone of inhibition, it means that it is susceptible. So, micrococcus luteus is susceptible because it is positive for the zone of inhibition. So, again, micrococcus luteus, yeah, yeah, lemon yellow color colony, okay, do not produce acid under anaerobic conditions. While the ones that are resistant are the cons, such as saprophyticus, epidermidis, and others. Okay, if it's a urine sample, then you should consider Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Presumptive identification can be done using the Novobiosin. Okay, so we add Novobiosin this. Oops, sorry, what happened? We add Novobiosin this. Okay, in heavy growth quadrant. So we have a quadrant here, and then we add Novobius in this. If resistant, it is Staphylococcus saprophyticus. If, if susceptible, it is likely, most likely, Staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay? So, you know, we can go so this is an example of the zone of inhibition, novobiosin. So this would be most likely Staphylococcus um, saprophyticus. And these colonies would be most likely Staphylococcus epidermis. Rapid identification is also possible for kits. So kits are available, such as the BBL staphy, staphy loss line. So all you have to do is to add the reagents onto your sus suspected colonies. And if there are agglutination, then that's considered to be as a positive result. 
or the Ceradine color slide, or the Staphorex, Bakti Staph. Okay, so these are examples. Okay, so the principle is that the latex particles, the one that can be found in the reagents, has a plasma coated carrier particles which can detect both the clamping factor and protein A. So it can even protect, uh, it can even detect protein A as a virulence factor in that particular organisms. Okay, so this is a very important algorithm. Okay, so how do we interpret this? So we check the gram stain. The gram stain is gram positive oxide, supposed to be purple. Okay, you do catalyst test. If it's negative, most likely we are looking at streptococci or the streptococcus. If it's positive in coagulase test, if it's positive in coagulase test, then most likely it is Staphylococcus aureus. See, that's that's the value of Staphylococcus. Of, that's the value of coagulase test. Gives us a single pathogenicity test for Staphylococcus. If it's positive, tapos ang kwento. But if it's negative, you have to do the bacitracine test and oxidase test. Okay? Positive plus susceptible, then you're looking at micrococcus. Oxidase negative and resistant, then you are looking at pons. And then you do the novel biosyn susceptibility test. If there's a zone of inhibition, we interpret it as susceptible. If it's susceptible, then most likely it is an example, another example of cons, but most likely it could be Staphylococcus epidermidis. But if it's resistant, then sure na, it's Staphylococcus saprophyticus. But then again, these are just what? Phenotypic characterizations. If you really want to confirm the organisms up to the exact species level, then you do PCR. 16S RNA sequence. Okay, so if we do that sequence, then you can really determine that this indeed Staphylococcus up to the species level. Because the ones that we're doing here is phenotypic characteristics. Okay, but is it important? Yes, because in the hospital, uh, you won't be spending so much money doing PCR because they are expensive. So majority of the hospitals would usually base on phenotypic characterization. Unless you are doing research, then maybe PCR would be most helpful, but in the hospital, it is mostly phenotypic characterization. Okay, so can we take a look at table 4.3 in your book? Because this will allow you to determine or to differentiate Staphylococcus from other gram-positive cocci. Okay, so these are very important tests. So this will determine yung oxygenation. This will determine kung meron bang flagella. And this will determine the tolerance in sodium chloride. And then catalase test, benzidine test, and then fermentation, acid, and then the lysostaphine. Uh, sensitivity test, erythromycin sensitivity test, and then the bacitracine test test. Okay, so this will differentiate, allow you to differentiate staphylococcus from other gram-positive coxi. So, hindi lang pala staphylococci, hindi lang pala streptococci, ang gram-positive coxi, still have others such as enterococci, Aerococci, aloeocoxi, planococci, stomatococci, macrococci, microcoxi, rothia. And these are the key tests for identification of clinically significant staphylococcus. So if you notice um, you are looking at the colonies, the presence of coagulase and clamping factor, 
the presence of heat stable nucleus, alkaline phosphatase, pyrolidonium, arylamidase, ornithine carboxylase, urease, beta galactosidase, acetoin, novobiosin resistant, polymixin B resistant, and then different types of sugars that can be fermented, such as the prehalose, mannitol, mannose, turanose, cytose, cellulobiose, maltose, and sucrose. Yeah. So this will allow us to differentiate different species of Staphylococcus. As you can see, no, sa Staphylococcus, only aureus is positive. Tapos for manitol, um, Staphylococcus is positive, and then Simulens would also be positive. Okay, so yung mga, there's some in this table, you don't have to memorize the table, but just take note of the noteworthy things to mention. And for the antimicrobial susceptibility testing, um, if we are talking about the non-beta lactamase producing staphylococcus, meaning to say they are not drug resistant, penicillin can be utilized. Unfortunately, look at the second sub bullet. It says here, 85 to 90% of S aureus are resistant to penicillin. If Alexander Fleming is still living until now, he will be sad because the antibiotic that he discovered back in 1928 is no longer effective against majority of Staphylococcus because of the ability of the organisms to produce beta-lactamase. Therefore, we do the beta-lactamase test. And then, take note also that we always perform susceptibility testing, especially in serious infections. Because nowadays, our, our concern would be the MRSA, or the methicillin resistant stabilococcide. Okay. And aside from MRSE, we also have the MRSE, methicillin resistant epidermidis. And the, to control such infection, we need really a barrier protection. Wearing of basic PPEs in the hospital uh, would play a significant deal in preventing MRSE infection, contact isolation, and a basic practice such as hand washing would be mostly useful and then of course as what i've told you uh, we treat it with vancomycin so how do we know if the organism is an mrsa phenotypically phenotypically we use cephosic in this if the if s or use is resistant to cephosic most likely it is mrsa but if we want to know the genotypic characteristic of S aureus, then we determine if MEC A is present. MEC A is the gene that would encode for S aureus, or that would, it's a marker that will tell us that S aureus is indeed an MRSA. So MEC A has a characteristic that will give positive result at 533 base pairs when you do the gel electrophoresis after you have amplified its DNA through PCR. So, makita ninyo yung it will yield at 533 base pair. So, MEC A encodes for the penicillin binding proteins. The gold standard is that MEC A gene is detected by PCR. But of course, not every hospital is capable of doing it. So that's why we phenotypically screen MRSA using cefositin. And we also have the vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus and the intermediate vancomycin intermediate staphylococcus aureus, the resistant and intermediate forms. Kind of dangerous because vancomycin is our drug of choice in cases of MRSE. 
macrolides. What are macrolides? So these are erythromycin, azithromycin. There are also reported macrolide resistance to clindamycin, although it may not be obvious. Okay, so erythromycin and clindamycin, since both of them are macrolides, they would have the same resistant pattern. So that's why to determine whether they are macrolide resistant or not, we do the D-test. So what is a D-test? So D-test uh, will determine if there's a growth between this, okay, so, but not on the side of clindamycin bits. So the principle is that D-test is the inducible resistance. Okay, so if you notice, there is a zone of inhibition here, but not on the side where erythromycin is here. So there's no zone of inhibition here. So this is the principle of inducible resistance. Erythromycin helps the organisms to have inducible resistance. So it appears like letter D. So that's why it's called D test. So this will determine resistance to clindamycin. So in summary, um, this is how we differentiate Staphylococcus. And next topic shall be Streptococcus.